Give us some money! Hello friends, hello strangers. Well, it's time to make another attempt at supplying a regular stream of content with another episode review of The Owl House. I don't exactly have an opening thesis to present, so... Lick, comma, subside, or whatever, let's begin! Today we're gonna be talking about episode 2 of the show, Witches Before Wizards. Now, I have the sneaking suspicion that if you were to ask a fan of the show what their favorite episode is, odds are this wouldn't be it. In fact, I can imagine most would try and argue that the show doesn't get really good until it gets heavy, or gay, or both. That's a bit of a shame because while I don't think Witches Before Wizards really is the best episode of the season, it is certainly undervalued. Sure, a pilot can get you hooked on a series, and the season finale can leave you satisfied, or frustrated, about all the time you've invested into it, but a second episode has a very important job as well. It's the immediate follow-up act. It's the episode that's intended to keep you invested in what's going on in the show. That's a very important job for how little recognition such an episode often receives. So already, this episode has to do quite a bit to prove to audiences that it didn't just waste all its good stuff for the pitch. And as far as execution goes, I would say that it pretty much stuck the landing. Like a lying witch and a warden, I'd say Witches Before Wizards is even better than I remember from my initial viewing. Before we delve too deeply into this, I just want to show this bit from the intro, as this is the first episode that properly unveils the opening theme for the show. See, because there are channels on the site that thrive on clickbaity mystery mongering, everyone and their grandmother started theorizing that this bit is meant to symbolize that the whole thing is just a dream, and that the boiling aisles aren't real, something something coma theory, and framing it as some sort of shocking revelation that the show is preparing to rock our world with. I would just like to take this moment to say that such a thing, whether it's true or not, would be the single most boring and unsatisfying revelation ever. It was just a dream is not new. It's one of the most tired cliches in entertainment. Coma theories are not inspired, they're cynicism for the sake of cynicism. Picking apart every single frame of animation for the sake of some mystery or twist you can't be certain is actually part of the show, all because you really like Gravity Falls and just want every show to be Gravity Falls, does little more than just give you clickbait. I want to say this now to establish that I'm not particularly a fan of the mystery mongering and the Owl House fandom since most of the theorizing they do isn't very interesting or inspired. Except the Ida is Amity's real mom theory. I don't know, for some reason that one always caught my fancy. But I'm planning to come back to this later in the episode. So Luce is ready to start her apprenticeship with Ida on the Boiling Isles and wastes no time hyping herself up for her self-insert Azura fanfic come to life. Sad thing is, even before she takes one step outside the Owl House, the emotional high of her latest adventure is starting to wane as she is reminded that the Boiling Isles are less a bog-standard D&D fantasy world and more like... Soulsborn. You heard me. The Owl House is the Dark Souls of Disney animation. It is a little sad to see Luz's enthusiasm for her new situation drain away bit by bit, but considering that she made the choice to stay in the Boiling Isles as an impulsive last-ditch effort to escape her problems in the human world, it's hardly surprising. Yeah, that's kind of important to remember. Luz's decision to run away from summer camp was rooted in an impulsive rejection of reality and choosing to hide in her fantasy world. Alas, her attempts to escape are all for naught. Whether the world you are in has magic or not, reality always finds you. Side note, this episode has a prime example of the brisk narrative pace that I've mentioned in previous videos. See, while King and Luz are off selling potions for Ido, we get a small montage of our young heroine's struggle during the whole ordeal. Emphasis on small because the whole thing is just one setup scene, one cutaway gag where Luz almost gets eaten by a doorbell, and then it skips to her already in a slump over the aisles not living to her expectations. In truth, it feels wrong to even call it a montage. A montage would at least adhere to the comedy rule of threes. Normally, I do find this show's philosophy of not padding for time to be refreshing, but this is perhaps the one example I can name offhand where it's something of a flaw. I mean, it's a little more than a quibble, but it felt important to bring up. Let this be a reminder to all aspiring writers, there's no surefire one way to ever write a good story. Narrative structure is like traits in Fallout. They each have their strengths and their drawbacks. Anyway, we get to the meat of the episode when Luz meets the wizard who decides to send her on a magical quest, claiming that she's the chosen one and using every tired fantasy cliche to suck her Luz in. What's great about this is that almost immediately there are red flags all over this situation. The episode has no qualms about telling the viewer that something is amiss. We go from seeing Luz being swept up in the fantastical wish fulfillment quest to Ida and King following after her and seeing the truth of her situation 
situation where the veil has been lifted. Luz is caught up in the illusion just long enough until the trap is sprung and the puppeteer has her, Ida, and King in his clutches. There's very little actual mystery to what's going on. We know that Luz is being lured into a trap, even if we don't know exactly who's doing the trapping or why. In a series that sells itself on being a fantasy horror, we really see the horror element in this episode. Of course, Luz either doesn't notice all these red flags or just flat out ignores them and goes along with it in spite of both Ida and King telling her that the whole situation is a huge fucking crock. Why? Because the wizard and everyone she meets on this quest is telling her everything she wants to hear. It doesn't matter to Luz that these whimsical sights she's seeing run in direct contrast to what she's already seen the Boiling Isles to be. It doesn't matter that the two people who gave her room and board are telling her that this is all a hoax. The magic man is jingling the keys in front of her and so she's going to follow, lured by some fucking magic anglerfish. This is where Luz's refusal to accept reality goes from disruptive and irresponsible to being flat out dangerous. The fact that she will readily trust a stranger enough to do whatever he asks her solely because he knew exactly what to say demonstrates how desperately she needed to learn some emotional maturity. It was extremely lucky of her that she ended up in the care of an actual respectable person like Ida rather than a complete predatory fuckhead like this guy. This is the kind of shit people do to prey on young people in the real world. This is the kind of shit that gets people trapped Perfect. Susie, worse things could have happened to you than just losing a thousand dollars, okay? You hang out with someone you don't even know. Say yes to whatever she asks you to do? She could have taken it a lot further than she did. Think about it! This was the first real lesson that Luz has to learn on the Boiling Isles, and most certainly one of the most important. But it wasn't the only lesson, because if it was, then this episode would have been an outright horror series and would have been better suited as a vignette for a Twilight Zone style anthology. But the episode doesn't end there. It in fact ends with Ida getting to the root of what made Luz so easy to prey on. She was strung along because she wanted so desperately to believe that she was special, that she was meant for something greater. Ida manages to nip that in the bud by telling Luz that the only one that gets to determine whether or not she's special is Luz herself. This is what ultimately sets this show apart from every edgelord, the real world world is awful, coma theory bullshit hot take less critical minds want to envision the show to be. There is cynicism to be found in the Owl House, but it's never cynicism for cynicism's sake. Ugh, great, now cynicism sounds weird. Within the harsh reality of any situation is an opportunity to be proactive. Luz learns that no one on Earth or the Boiling Isles has the power to give her some grand purpose in life. So she's taught to say, screw it, I'll be my own chosen one. It's baby's first lesson in individualism. Besides, Luz is better off living in a world where destiny isn't a thing. If there's anything that can be learned from fantasy stories old and new, it's that the hand of fate are total fucking knobs. From our first breath to our last, every decision is made for us. Anyway, it's been a hot minute, let's gush about Ida some more. Right off the bat in this episode, Ida is already in rare form. She's in absolute morning mood while also being absolute goals. Oh, I wish I could begin my day by drinking blood. Also, is it just me or is Ida hotter in her sleepwear than she is her usual clothes? It's probably helped by the fact that in a good chunk of the beginning, her eyes are slightly narrowed, almost like they're lidded, you know? And I'm more turned on by women in pajamas than lingerie. I just want to know they feel comfortable. I on that note, I'd just like to take a minute to appreciate Ida's overall design, which is something I've surprisingly neglected to do in my previous videos. Shocking, I know. Everything about her aesthetic, from being an older woman to having some angular features, very much screams Disney villain, and her beta design would honestly be right at home standing beside the like of Maleficent, Yzma, or Mother Gothel, and yet she's among the main cast as a deuteragonist. It's hardly the most subversive thing Disney has ever done in recent years, but I still think it's neat. Though to keep the rest of this video from just thirsting over every single frame of Ida, and believe me, I could, I'm just gonna get into what really makes Ida shine this episode, and really most episodes she's in. She strikes a balance between morally dubious, jaded mentor, and absolute fucking sweetheart. See, Ida wastes no time putting Luz to work selling her potions all across town, but nonetheless takes a degree of responsibility for her apprentice's safety as she sends King to go with her and then goes after Luz herself when she goes off to chase her escapist fantasy. It's still quite a ways before the Owl Lady develops those pesky old maternal attachments to Luz. Hell, she woke up not even remembering Luz's name. So that means every precaution taken and reaction had by Ida is less grounded in emotional attachment in this point and more just having a conscience. Because 
Because think about it, by the third act of the episode, Ida realizes what's going on. This demon has lured Luz into a trap specifically to get Ida to go after her and fall into that same trap. If she were going purely by survival instincts alone, she would have just cut her losses and let the puppeteer have Luz. Remember, she wasn't under any real obligation to protect this kid. There were no consequences for her to face other than just losing a newly gained, dubiously qualified apprentice. She's risking a lot more by going after the puppeteer to try to save Luz. And she does it anyway. Why? Simply put, she's just good people. And then, when the danger is over and Luz is visibly crestfallen by the whole affair, Ida goes out of her way to lift her spirits when she could have just as easily went, Yeah, life's a bitch, now get the hell out of my house, you're more trouble than you're worth. Even before she became a good mom, Ida was always a good person. It's a real showcase to how, despite being an individualist, Ida is never an objectivist. There's neither any legal obligation nor any Ayn Rand measure of self-serving bullshit that leads Ida to try and protect Luz. She does it because she believes believes it's the right thing to do. Full stop. On that note, let's consider exactly what it is that makes Ida so different from the predatory puppeteer besides, you know, having a conscience. Because on paper, you could pull the you and I are the same villain spiel when it comes to the both of them. Sure, they're both shady business people who Luz latches herself onto to fuel her own escapist fantasies, but that's more or less where the similarities end. Where the puppeteer sought to deceive Luz and prey on her desire to be special, Ida is seldom ever dishonest with her. The one time she lied to Luz at this point of the show was when she made up the nature behind King's crown to get her to join the heist in the last episode, and even then she still upheld her end of the bargain and offered to send Luz back home. Ida was always very open and honest with Luz about what their situation was and what her apprentice was getting into, and when the reality of the situation became hard for Luz to swallow, Ida doesn't have to lie about anything to lift her spirits. She just encourages her to see things from a different perspective. God, I fucking love this witch! So yeah, Witches Before Wizards may not be the best episode of the bunch, but I honestly would consider it up there. And that's not just because I'm always thirsty for the owl lady. Anyway, stay tuned for the next episode where we meet two major players for the rest of the season. Toodles!